Okay, I'm telling a story which about things that changed my life. I grew up in the 1940s, mm -hmm. and my mom was addicted to instant coffee in the morning. Every morning, my dad would bring her a cup of instant coffee, and we thought coffee was bad. This is the 1940s. Oh, Mom, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be doing that. My first cup of coffee was when I was 23 years old in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Oh, wow. What I was was teaching. Well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Buna. I was teaching in this. Uh, I came in late to teach in the school. I was really out of it. And one of the teachers uh, had a little house on the compound, and she invited us for coffee. And I said, I thought now is the time. I'm never going to make it through the day. As, as we say in English, I was totally shit faced. All right. <laughs> uh, this woman invited us over. She gave me a, I had a double espresso, my first cup of wow. coffee. A double espresso. I woke up for the first time in my life. Yeah. I thought, is this how everybody feels? I don't get <laughs> high on coffee, I just feel normal. My life before that was a disaster. I had flunked out of college. I didn't know what I wanted, all these things. Everything was fine. Three things happened in Ethiopia. Number one, I had coffee and I'm still doing it. Okay. And the sequel to that is when I came back, I took my mother to Starbucks uh -huh. and gave her all the coffee she wanted. I said, mom, you can have all you want. Have a cappuccino. It was wonderful, okay? <laughs> it felt so good. Uh, I feel there's a book in there somewhere. Coffee saved my life. <laughs> it sure did. Uh, so two other things happened. Uh, one of the teachers in the school I was at is now my wife. We've still been, we're still married 56 years and wow. we're doing great. Okay. It's wonderful. That's amazing. It, it, yeah, it really works. And also I learned to speak Amharic. Okay. That's no mean feat. <laughs> and that, that really helped. But Tam Turuno, Amharic. And I had a conversation, I promised you I would tell you about this. We were invited to meet the emperor of Ethiopia, Haile Selassie. Right. And this was years ago. And I was already, I had this little speech prepared in Amharic. He answered me in English. <laughs> oh no, the problem we all have. <laughs> so that's my introduction. I'm still drinking coffee, still doing languages, still well, married. All those things well, are great. All, all of those things are absolutely wonderful. Um, so, I mean, listen, Stephen, it is amazing to have you with us for the Polyglot Conference Global. I'm really, really pleased that you made it and very happy that you said yes to my invitation to join us because um, I love your stories. I love your wisdom and your experience and I'm not the only one because I spent a room I spent a room I can't even speak English I spent a weekend in a room in London with a group of people and it was at the memorize offices with the memorize team oh, and yeah. <laughs> Ben one of the CEOs of memorize he mentioned your name possibly about 50 times but I wasn't counting I lost track after 50 times really? he, he referenced you so much and of course we all did we were all talking about you because you're, you're the talk of the town of course any town um so it's really really nice to have you here after talking about you so much <laughs> last week last weekend in London uh so I feel highly honored and um as do many people who wrote to say how excited they were to um, to have you with us. And, and so I even got questions in as well, but we'll get to those later. We'll start with some uh, questions that I actually want to ask you myself because I'm that kind of person. Um, I'm a bit mean like that. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, I mean, so were you always interested in languages? I mean, did you? No. Did you no, <laughs> no, not this interesting. Good question. Um, I grew up totally monolingual. The only mm -hmm. in the Midwest in the United States, my grandparents spoke Yiddish to my parents, but we were basically had the impression this is not for us. No one expected us to say anything to acquire it, nothing. And of course, we didn't. All right. Mm -hmm. I went to Hebrew school. Oy, Vezmir. It was awful. <laughs> It was learning the alphabet over and over again and a few prayers. I remembered absolutely nothing. It was total and complete 
torture. I took French in high school because my favorite aunt, who was very influential, uh, liked French. So I, I'll be like her. I've been very lucky with women in my life. She's one of them. It's been amazing. Anyway, uh, I took French in high school. And at, after two years, the instructor said, very nice man. He said, you know, I'm going to give you a passing grade, but you don't deserve it. I've looked at your record and I don't want to see a failure in French. You'll never get into college. Just don't tell anybody about this and don't ever take French again at this school. <laughs> of course, I agreed. So <laughs> the change happened. Again, the women in my life, my mother, oh, I can't thank her enough, all the good things. She decided in between my first two years of college that I should go on what's called a youth hostel bicycle tour where you meet up with about 10 other kids your age and you go on a bike ride. We went down the Rhine Valley, all right? Mm -hmm. And it was a lot of fun, uh, good kids, wonderful. There are languages around, but I you know, went through Germany and all that, I didn't pay much attention. It wasn't for me. The last day we were at a youth hostel in Switzerland. It changed my life. Uh -huh. There was a party. I sat near a young man who was effortlessly and beautifully speaking German to a couple of people, speaking French to a couple of people, and doing pretty well with English uh, talking to us. And I decided I want to be like him. Wow. I decided at that moment, being a polyglot, what you call a serial polyglot expression, I just picked up from one of your interviews. Very interesting, good idea. I wanted to be a polyglot. It wasn't that I want to learn to speak French. Yeah. It's languages. Then the tour was over and I talked to our director, the guy who's a little bit older than we were, he's like 24. And he said, go to Paris and enroll at the Alliance Francaise. And I did that. I got on a train, three weeks in Paris, uh, all grammar, but it had lots, it was all in French and I had, had been exposed to the grammar. I made a lot of progress. That was the beginning. And I decided then I was gonna be a polyglot. It wasn't French, it wasn't German, it wasn't any particular language. And I discovered that people like us are very rare. Mm -hmm. It's a small, small group. And I'm always surprised when I meet uh, anyone who has the, the same kind of orientation. But for me, uh, going after languages seems natural. Mm -hmm. It seems right. The uh, feminist Gloria Steinem, very insightful person. She said, when I'm writing, I don't have the feeling I should be doing something else. Isn't that beautiful? It is. So uh, when I'm reading a book in another language, having a conversation, uh, doing my linguistics work, I don't think I should be doing something else. It's beautiful. It's my path. And we all have a path. We're mm -hmm. all a little different. Otherwise, the human race would never survive because they need all of us. So that's how it happened. Went back to college. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, after that, the, the story continues just a little. Uh, uh, I was with my, my wife, she was my wife by then. And one of our adventures, well, we, we were in Ethiopia. I was one of the few in Ethiopia in the Peace Corps who was interested in Amharic. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that? Uh, I, was there, I, I wasn't the best at it. There was some other guy who lived with Ethiopians and he got really good. He was amazing. I admired him. But I did pretty well in Amharic and I liked it. Mm -hmm. The others didn't care. I was kind of a mini celebrity in the little school I taught in just outside Addis Ababa because I, by then I was okay in German. I had done music in Vienna, another story. I thought I went to Vienna to do piano. Deep down, I realized I did it because I would get to acquire German, okay? <laughs> and I was much more involved with that. I did okay with piano. But, uh, and I was, I was kind of a mini celebrity because I could converse in French and converse in German. And I really loved Amharic. And people thought that was very interesting. My roommate, housemate, I got in touch with him about this a few days ago. And I wrote him, I said, Frank, I haven't talked to you in all these years, but I want to thank you for something. You pointed, he and I were very different. We got along, but he was a totally different personality. He says, you said, Steve, I see you're interested in languages. Why don't you do something about that for a profession? I had never thought of that. 
<laughs> that kind of opened the door, okay? So that worked and that's how it all happened. Uh, after Ethiopia, my wife and I went uh, back to Los Angeles, basically to avoid getting into the army and going to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got into a teacher training program for English. I loved it. It was linguistics and language acquisition. Mm -hmm. The courses were about phonological systems, uh, Chomsky and grammar, which I still absolutely love, one of my absolute heroes. Uh, and people were interested in language. We could talk about it. First time that it ever happened to me. And for the first time, I was a pretty good student in school and connected. So that's basically how it happened. Uh, one at a time. I never decided to go out and get a language. Uh, what happened was I was sent somewhere and I took advantage of what was there. And I was surprised that nobody else did. And now I see how unusual you are and I am. They talk about instrumental motivation, you know, to work at a job or study in a country or integrative because you feel a bond with a culture. In our case, it's a language <laughs> that's good enough. Yeah, well, it, it is. It's that kind of the need. I mean, you, you obviously mentioned that need as well. But one thing I want to go back on actually is you, you, you talked about the term polyglot and, and you said we polyglots. And I'm interested in that because, I mean, I, I would describe you as such myself. The term is a bit of a weird term in English. It's one of those normal terms in certain languages, but in English, it's a weird term. And the term polyglot, and I want, I want your thoughts on this actually, is the same really as multilingual. It's just it's different roots, Greek roots versus Latin roots. For me, that meaning is not the same. Because for me, a multilingual is someone who just has multiple languages and a polyglot is someone that goes after languages they don't necessarily need. And I don't, right. I think that's not defined in a dictionary, but it's exactly. my interpretation now. Do you agree with me? And do you agree that you're a polyglot? Absolutely. You've been helpful <laughs> in that. Uh, I, we, we should continue this conversation and keep complimenting each other. This is good therapy for both <laughs> of us. Uh, I read this morning an interview with you and you said something I thought was practically unknown, but that's what we're talking about. We are ser serial polyglots and we're interested in any language. When I hear any language, I want to understand it. I want to acquire it. I want to speak it. It's like someone who has a, a sex problem, who's promiscuous, <laughs> okay? He's oh, I've got to have her, she's beautiful. We have that problem with languages. We just fall in love with any language we hear. We're very unusual. In Ethiopia, I told you my friends weren't like this. Even in Austria, where I basically went to do piano, there are only a few of us who are interested in languages. You know, it wasn't a big deal. Yeah. Also, when I was in France, same thing everywhere. We're an unusual group and society needs us. Mm -hmm. This is a, a theory I call path theory. Everyone is very good at something and we like it and we're puzzled why other people don't like it as much and don't do as well, because it seems natural. Uh, a guy named Chinsek Mahali, wonderful uh, sociologist, said the world needs people like us yeah. because nobody has all these talents. The world would not survive without people who've specialized, gotten very interested in some things that we've done with language. Uh, you don't you don't have to be good at everything. You have to find your what you like and get better at it. That's the idea. Great essay called Don't Go to Your Left. We always give this advice when you're in basketball. Learn to bounce the ball with your left hand. Learn to shoot with your left hand. No, do it with your right hand. Just get good at that. Don't worry. It's, it's more than enough. Don't work on your weak spots. Find your strengths. School hasn't learned that. And that's been a big problem. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting you mentioned the school system because I think um, there are lots of tricks that are missed with school. And, and there, there's a weird thing with language and language and education. And sometimes it, it's just taught in such a way that it's so dry and boring for people that they, they yes. don't get the benefits. <laughs> how, how would you improve on it? What would you do if you, if you could re- reconstruct, deconstruct, and then reconstruct the education system when it comes to languages. 
what would your ideal school be? The ideal for, let's say, foreign language, for sure, mm -hmm. uh, would be stories in the beginning. This is Benico Mason's plan. I like it a lot. Teacher comes in and tells stories that have stood the test of time that people all think are interesting. Uh, she uses Grimm's fairy tales uh, and works on making them comprehensible and interesting. Draws a lot of pictures, occasional translation if you need it. So English class is story time. Isn't that beautiful? That's, That's nice. all it is. That, so in the course of a couple of semesters, you may hear a couple hundred stories or more that are reasonably comprehensible. You don't study them. You're not quizzed on them. After that, it merges into reading. She calls it guided self-selected reading. Lots and lots of easy reading. The first day of reading class, this is so clever. Students come in. They've had listening to stories for a while, so they've built up some knowledge. Benico comes in, spreads the graded readers out on a table. Mm -hmm. Students can browse. They don't have to finish one that they started. They find one that is interesting to them and they become narrow readers. I want to add to that, that I've been working with this myself. It's really worked um, here in uh, where I live in the Los Angeles area. Uh, there's a, a supermarket that has special hours on Friday for old people. So that's when I go. And uh, first time I got there, the guy at the counter, I saw his name, it was Fidel. Mm -hmm. So of course I spoke Spanish to him, okay. and, which is not my best language. I would say it's four or five. He answered in English, mm -hmm. which you're supposed to do. And I said, Fidel, tu puedes ayudarme. Mi meta, my goal in life, mi meta is hablar español como ustedes. I want to speak Spanish the way you do. He really liked that. Okay. <laughs> he says, Hablamos español. I've been speaking Spanish to him early Friday mornings for the last year and a half. Fantastic. I'm getting, he's the only one I speak Spanish to, occasional here and then. Uh, I'm getting better, not because of Fidel. He only can talk to me for like a minute. He's got other customers. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I then go home and read easy books in Spanish. Lots of called graded readers. Um, mm -hmm. Two good authors, Bill Van Patten, who's an expert in language. He's wonderful. And Adriana Ramirez. I'll tell you just a bit of one of her books. This is important. A young man, high school student, goes to um, Bogota. And he's there to meet a friend. And he gets lost. His Spanish is terrible. He's had, you know, two semesters of grammar. And he sees another young man, and he basically manages to convince, tell him he's got to find this hotel. And his new friend, we'll call him the guide, says, come with me, I'll take you there. They're on their way, and they run into two beautiful young ladies. The beautiful young ladies come up to the guide, give him hugs, kisses on the cheek, hold his hand, and then the guide introduces the girls to the narrator of the story, and they give him hugs, okay? And occasionally, you know, they're very friendly. Finally, they go on their way. And his new friend says, I suppose you're wondering what's going on here. And he says, these girls are my cousins. Well, I've known them all my life. And the fact that they did it to you and hugged you, that's the way we are in Bogota. Don't think anything of it. It's just a style of living. The whole book is interesting cultural potential misunderstandings that the storyteller tells you about. That's very nice. Beautiful. That's there's what we call graded readers have become literature. Mm -hmm. They become a very some are nonfiction, some are fiction, some are stories, you know, some aren't, you know, uh, etc. But that's what I've been reading as a kind of student of Benico's for the last year and a half. And my Spanish has gotten really much, much better. At the supermarket, Fidel has told everybody about me. And the bilingual people there all come up to me and speak Spanish now. And he's, he's told them I speak 10 languages, which is utterly wrong, but it's made me a celebrity and they ask me questions and it's kind of fun. It's nice. I mean, it's nice that people have got questions as well. I always like it when people have questions. I think it's, it's quite flattering and it's, um, it's also nice to share, right? I mean, that's the human experience, sharing. and Sharing is caring, as they say. Oh, um, stories. Yeah. It's always nice to hear stories. Tell me though, with 
with the education system, okay, let's say we've, recon we've reconstructed the school. What do we do with the people who have already graduated? Because one thing I've noticed whenever I, I, I do courses quite often for languages as part of the process, and I know it's not entirely in, in the realms of, of where, where you are with this in the stories, but I find that they have their own narrative very often. The goods courses that I do, they have their own narratives to follow. But what I do notice is that a number of students are so ingrained in that system of I have to know right. all of the grammar and how it all works yes. and things that aren't really relevant. Like they'll ask a gazillion questions for lots of words that they really don't need. Right. How do you... Richard, what has happened here, excuse me for interrupting, what has happened here is you have revealed where I have failed. No question. All these years, 40, 50 years of writing papers, giving lectures, nobody knows about this stuff. There are reasons why, and there are things we can do about it. The first is, you know, it's changed the courses, but it's not going to happen. I picked up the, uh, I won't mention any names of schools, I picked up a catalog from Santa Monica Community College, okay, <laughs> and it had all the language classes. One of them said natural approach. I was co-author of the book on this, and it was all grammar, um, et cetera. So I wrote a note to the supervisor, and she basically said, mind your own business. You know, you know, nobody really knows about it. Nobody cares, um, et cetera. So this is slow. I have to identify the problems, then a solution. We're not just going to be just pessimistic. There are reasons why it hasn't worked. Uh, number one, if you, where, how are you going to find out? Well, it isn't very often you can get to you know, a top lecture, say from Jeff McQuillan or myself and all that. Uh, things written about it are nearly incomprehensible and much too long, and I can barely understand them. Not only that, they're written in technical books, which are hideously expensive. Mm -hmm. What I have been trying to push is short papers in open access places that are free, that are comprehensible, that tell, of course, lots of stories, and places mm -hmm. you can go to try it out. And this is where I hope the internet is going to help us a lot more than we have, where yeah. people can get these things and get them for free. Sorry, Memorize. Mm -hmm. Get it for free. I'm wondering, actually, we were talking about graded readers. Maybe we need a graded reader version of these papers <laughs> so that we can... I think you're right. Yes. I, uh, Adriano Ramirez, a person I admire very much, has a little uh, discussion on YouTube about uh, her stories and all that. She does it in Spanish. And it's a little too hard for me. Yeah. I'm going to talk to her about this. An introduction to language acquisition made comprehensible yeah i think it is important that it's it's made comprehensible and and that people understand the logic behind it because very often what i find is people will struggle on with um with things that they that are not comprehensible at all and and then get lose motivation and be completely bored and then give up of course um, or they will be so fixated on having to know certain words that they used to get you to know and I, I always say look it, it's fine to learn a word or something if you know you need it and you're going to repeat it again and again and again but we don't need to learn 130 or different countries um, if we only really have a you know sort of contact with three of them that we ever talk about in our lives yeah the cure is uh, don't look it up unless you really are curious yeah. Don't try to remember it. Don't review it. Uh, I got that from a person I regard as my personal language therapist, Steve Kaufman. Uh, he yeah. gives the nicest advice. He says when he was reading something and he looks up a word, by the time he gets back to the book, he's forgotten it. <laughs> <laughs> that really helped. Yeah, I mean, he's completely right. And, and actually, one of the things about you know learning all these words that I notice as well, and I know it from my from my own experience of being on courses in at school and university and all that stuff, is people remember what they've forgotten, but they don't remember the contents. They just remember they've forgotten it, and yes. that is a huge motivation killer. Huge. The uh, research from the University of Illinois very helpful to us. They say each time you hear a word, an unfamiliar word. 
and you get it and you understand it or you read it, you don't get the whole thing. You don't acquire it from that. You have to hear it 15, 20 more times. And each time you get a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, which is why you need lots of input and don't worry about each individual example. Yeah. Yeah. Get lost in the book, get lost in the story. Absolutely. And the memory is such a funny thing, isn't it? We've, we sort of, I always find as well that when, what people do is that they'll study, study, study like crazy for a test. They'll get the best mark and they remember the achievement. But what they forget is what they did to get that mark. They forget also how, how fast they forgot that stuff after the test. But then what they do is they take that as a benchmark as what they can do. And it soon becomes what they believe is their average. Eager, their expectation. Absolutely. So it's people like Steve and you and me who've done this. One of our major ways we contribute to society is sharing this with other people. It takes a while. It takes a while. Don't worry about it. Enjoy the story. Enjoy the conversation. Your subconscious is working on it. It's okay. I mean, this brings me nicely actually onto a question. It's quite a, a, a question with a bit of context as well. There's a story behind it, which I think you'll appreciate. But I got this question through on the form and it's from Alex. And Alex says, I have cognitive problems which make studying everything difficult. So I found it hard about learning a second language. And it was life changing when he did get into second language learning because he was able to come conversational in a new language and from it being a complete fantasy it was an achievable goal and he said he's he's been working on French so now it's amazing what he can now do with French he can um, use this really good teacher who's a storyteller and uses 100% CI um, but he said a few months ago he turned his attention to Ukrainian and oh, well, good yeah, and, and, and the thing is that now he's struggling with it. He said he finds it very hard to find input that is something that will grasp his attention, that is suitable That's it. for the beginner level. And, you know, things that sort of he needs this, the stories, the visual context. So even some of the children's TV shows in Ukrainian are just not right. where it's at for him. And he, he's finding it very limiting. And he's just wondering if you have any advice. Yes. Uh, well, I appreciate his having raised the question. It's a big one. He needs a place where he can get lots and lots of comprehensible input. That's easy. That's very interesting. So interesting, he'll forget it's in another language. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have not provided. It's not his fault. That's what the profession should be working on. Tons of stories. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't that, can't you just imagine how much fun that would be? You know, getting easy input, interesting right from the start, and then reading material at the interview, intermediate level, which we are kind of stumbling toward. But the examples I gave you are very, very rare. It's mm -hmm. technology that's going to help us and good books. It, and understanding the process that it's not his fault. By the way, I don't think study helps for anything. Plato said something like that. He says, um, exercise where it's made necessary, you have to do it. It doesn't do any harm to the body, but trying to learn things that are out of context, that don't mean anything to you, that never sticks. Mm -hmm. So this is true of everything we do. I want to tell you about one study, which I think is one of the most important ever done. I found a lot of research that says that people who read a lot, especially fiction, know more. Readers who read lots of fiction know more about everything. <laughs> they know more about history, geography, science. It's because of the novels, all right? Mm -hmm. And a guy named Keith Stanovich did a wonderful study on this. He gave college students, beginning college students, lots of tests of various areas, you know, science, history, all this stuff. Then questionnaires. The best predictor of knowing all this stuff on a wide variety of tests was your familiarity with popular literature uh, and movies, whether you've seen good movies, et cetera, okay? Uh, that was the best predictor. Your grades in school were a lousy predictor. 
Yeah. If you not study its exposure to interesting situations and stories. Isn't that wonderful? So yes. this goes deep into everything in education. Yeah, well, we do. We, we, we retell stories all the time. That's just a natural human situation from sort of from as far back as we can remember, you know, sort of the sagas and all of the old tales and everything was was told and retold. And that's what we remember. And that's, that's how well, children like stories so much. Big studies on it show about 90 percent of kids like it when mommy and daddy tell them stories. The 10 percent who don't mommy and daddy don't like telling stories. <laughs> it's everywhere. Yeah. Where are you with the telling stories? Where are you with sort of, you know, the old, the ancient Greek tradition of learning things wrote to tell stories? Where does, where do you sit with that, with the storytelling? I haven't thought about it at all, but you've just made me interested. <laughs> Thank you. That is exactly the right thing. We have got to look for historical precedences of teachings through story, because it's the only way anything ever happens yeah. that's yeah. magnificent nothing else works when you look at stanovich's studies all the other thing if you're good in math that doesn't mean you know a lot if you're good in creative thinking and tests and all that the raven's matrices that doesn't matter it's familiarity not with great literature but popular literature isn't that wonderful like if you've read nancy drew i mean it's stuff like that that educates kids yeah yeah and talking about children i did have another question for you from pancha french who's one of the other speakers actually at the conference and um, the question is about what your opinion is on the emphasis of language exposure before the age of three like using baby sign language as a bridge to comprehensible input i have no idea all i know is it is certainly not necessary uh okay. this idea of younger is better who knows? We have so many cases where you start, you know, in my case, a new language when I'm in my 70s, and it's gone perfectly fine, okay, which is another issue. My doctoral dissertation was attacking the idea of the critical period, that you've got to get these things as a child. And uh, Eric Lenneberg said, that's when the left and the right, you know, separate out. That's the start of the critical period. Great story about him. Um, I basically showed he was wrong. I didn't intend to, I thought he was right, but I found it wasn't working. I wrote him, he wrote me back and said, you're probably right, <laughs> okay? Because I found <laughs> similar things. And I discussed it with, I'm now bragging, this is the ultimate name dropping, you ready? Okay, I, discussed ready. It, I discussed it with Noam Chomsky. Oh. Can you imagine? <laughs> I did a webinar with him. He and Lenneberg were pals. They were okay. students at the same time. And we agreed, there's nothing wrong with being wrong. No. This is where we all make progress. And I think Lenneberg was excited about my work as I was, yeah. which is just amazing. No, I think the age thing is bogus. That's my suspicion. I don't know any research that supports it. And I'm always amazed at how well adults do. And if you don't mind, that brings me to another topic that's related, sure. and that's, sure. that's accent. Um, the idea is you can't get a good accent when you're older. I think you do. I think our accents are perfect at any age. I'll give you the story. I was in Ethiopia and I met a guy there who worked for the British Council. He told me the story, what it was like going to secondary school in London. He says, I took French and the final exam is enough to frighten any young adolescent you had to speak French in front of five teachers, all in French, et cetera. So he decided to humiliate and insult them because he hated them, hated the system. He used what he, he dressed French. He had a beret, had a glass of what looked like red wine. And he spoke in what he thought was really fully exaggerated. He says, Ah, bonjour, mes amis, je suis très content d'être ici avec vous. Hein? Comment ça va aujourd'hui? They loved it. He said, why didn't you talk like that in our classes? That was excellent. My goodness. Finally, you've got it, or at least fairly close. We don't do it because we feel silly. Yep. 
Ac accent is a marker of group membership, club membership. Peter Ustinov, as you know, is a fabulous actor. And in French movies, he sounds French, no question. He was quoted in an interview, I heard him say this, he says, when I'm, I meet someone from France, I don't use that beautiful accent. I have an English accent. <laughs> I can't do because I'm not a member of that group. Yeah, there is something really funny about that, especially um, with English speakers, because that's obviously the, 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 the group I know best um, when they're learning foreign languages. But I, I've seen it in other countries, too. Um, there always used to be a I don't know if you had this in the US, but my nan spoke beautiful scouse and um but when the phone rang she'd, she'd pick up the phone and she'd say hello and she'd put on her best phone voice ever exactly <laughs> exactly what this shows is that the language acquisition device doesn't shut off mm. we can do this at any age so we're back to this are you better before three or better before puberty none of that matters we are very, I suspect, we are very good at any age. Isn't that wonderful? I think so. I think, you know, I'm with you. I think that it's just getting over the psychological barriers more than anything else uh, when it comes to a lot of this stuff. That's exactly. the, main, the main thing. And then some nice guidance if we need some help knowing where our tongue needs to be to say a certain sound in a certain way to, to help our ears out a little bit. I think it works very nicely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely absolutely and it really doesn't matter if we have our accent uh, people how do you overcome this output filter well you can try method acting you know and sound like someone who cares yeah exactly and not to worry about it myself in my life so we can make the world um more multilingual i suppose and norma on twitter asked the question do you think that being monolingual will be a thing of the past and speaking two or more languages will become more normalized in all countries thanks to conferences like this one? No, I think it's going in the opposite direction, frankly, because mm -hmm. English conquers everything. The number of people who speak English as a second language is far more than the number who speak it as a first language. And we all have this like the incident I had with Haile Selassie. Everywhere I go, when I was in Israel, my Hebrew is not so bad, okay? We, my wife and I did kibbutz, all that pretty good. Uh, the only time I spoke Hebrew, we were there six months. The only time I spoke Hebrew was on the kibbutz. When I went to see my family, my family's still in Tel Aviv. We're very close, we like each other a lot. The older people, I speak Yiddish. The younger people, English, English, English. They speak English better than I do, okay? <laughs> so it's kind of hopeless. The world is turning to English as the international language. It's already there with the air, air, pilots, airline, et cetera. That's it. Uh, for better or worse, it's changing. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I saw something um, actually on a TikTok video today talking about this in, in Spain, um, whether or not, the, and the question was, Will English become the the new lingua franca within certain communities, yeah. even within countries, yes. uh, or within previously what were countries like? I see this in Yugos former Yugoslavian countries. They they will often, if it's an Albanian speaker, they'll often now use English, whereas before they would all have had Serbo Croat. Of course, now uh, this is all changing. So I I definitely do see exactly what you've described um, as becoming more and more the thing you have your home language and then you have English to speak to other people. It's true. And you know, it's not a bad thing because you know, Poland can talk to Korea. Yeah. It's there, it's, it's now the lingua franca we've hoped for. So look on the bright side as well. It's kind of less fun for people like you and me. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. you know people... I mean, and the European Union is trying to um, encourage people to learn not just English, but a second or third language, as well as their own language and in English. And I've been to meetings where they've, they've discussed this and I've seen things come out of um, the EU talking about how they would do this. Do you, do you I mean, do you think, and this is actually leads on to the question, another question that, that Norma asked, 
do you think that governments should invest in language learning? Like, should they get more people in teacher positions to be able to get more people well, speaking more languages than, than yes, despite English? what I said about English? There's a lot to be done in education that needs to be better supported. Of course, bilingual education is marvelous. The better you know your whole language, the better you are in the language of the country, it, cognitive advantages, everything, everything, everything. We know the best way that uh, countries need people to keep their own language. If you want to have diplomats, spies, all those things, it's a good thing. So it's in our national interest. Don't send them off to take special classes. Let's keep the home language growing. And the easy way to make that happen, guess what? Pleasure reading. <laughs> we have a couple of cases that have emerged. I've gotten from my former students, colleagues, people who keep the home language, who like to read for pleasure, light fiction, whatever, get very good at it. I have this uh, former student, Grace Cho, tells this wonderful story. She grew up with Korean and also speaks Spanish, by the way, lived in South America. She's a bilingual teacher. She went to a party. Yeah. And at this party were lots of Korean Americans in their 30s. She found several of them spoke Korean very, very well. And they spent nearly their entire life in the United States. They hadn't been to Korea in 30 years, maybe. So their Korean was excellent. She made appointments to interview them. Isn't that clever? Yes. She found what they had in common. They were pleasure readers in Korean. Oh, okay. Yeah. That is cool. Yeah, that is really, really cool. Um, I mean, I think you're right. You know, when, when you enjoy a language and when you see the relevance, I think this is the thing, right? We've got the battle is really won at that point. Um, people often ask, you know, I, I get asked, you know, which language do you learn? And I think depending on where you are and how much contact you have with it as well, also plays a role, right? Um, and you seeing, the, seeing the benefit of, of the language as well, seeing a relevance. For, so for why. people know, let me jump in. The problem is finding things to read. They're not there. My uh, colleague, Nishan Ashtari, did a number of really good papers on this. She did her work in the Los Angeles area where there's lots of people from Iran. And there's lots of Farsi spoken at home, okay? She first visited Farsi bookstores. Uh, all they had was very serious things like uh, the sayings of Rumi, which is of course wonderful, but mm -hmm. still it's over the head of a beginner. Uh, and grammar books, self-help grammar books. Nothing for the beginner. She went to a local public library in an area with lots of Farsi speakers. All she found there were the only things that were in Farsi were grammar books and self-help books for someone who married a, someone from Iran, uh, et cetera. So uh, this is tough. It's not out there. We don't have access. There's very little to read. I have trouble finding books in Spanish. Yeah. Just for fun. Yeah, I can imagine. I think that not everything is on the market. As no. Before. Not um, everything in the library. No. So... Are there ways that people can access these things or create them themselves? Or, I mean, technology is moving on. I mean, is this is this a way forward, people to start creating these kinds of things? I hope so. I think it'd be wonderful. Uh, the champion of this is Bill Van Patten, who grew up with Spanish, fully bilingual and an expert. I like Bill a lot because he supports my work and says I'm right. So, you know, I like Bill. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Uh, he's written a lot of good books in Spanish. Okay. And they're excellent. They're reflective of how he was brought up, his family, all this stuff. And they're quite compelling. He's written novels in English, as a matter of fact. So yeah, there are people doing this, but not nearly enough. Yeah. That's the problem. There's some questions in the chat, and I just want to sort of try and link them in in a, in a sensible way. And one of them I find quite interesting here that follows on from this is, I've never liked reading, <laughs> but I really like to watch videos. The same reasoning of lost in a book I can do with a video that I see many times with and without subtitles and with and without translation. Do you think that is a reasonable substitute? It's a reasonable source of input. 
I think there are other places. I'll give you what I think the answer is, is with two words, mm -hmm. comic books. Okay. Comic books. Uh, you are talking to the world's leading expert in comic book research and how it applies to literacy. The reason I can say that is I'm the only one who's ever investigated it. <laughs> so by default, the world's number one. And here's more bragging. This is this is at the level of, of meeting Noam Chomsky, okay? Mm -hmm. I had lunch with the inventor of Spider-Man, Stan oh, wow. B. He invited me. Wow. Is that cool or what? <laughs> well, finally, you have a little respect for me. Thank you. Okay. The original so, spider. The original spider. The original Stan. Here's how it happened and what I learned from Stan Lee. Mm -hmm. uh, I was teaching at my university, USC at the time, and the comic book club invited Stan Lee. Now, I love comic books, always have. I've always been a comic book reader. It's another story. And I went to the lecture. It was brilliant. As you can imagine, if you've seen him in the cameos in the movies, that's what he's like. Very open, easy. And I asked a question from the floor. I said, you know, uh, Peter Parker is the uh, real life character of Spider-Man, this real person. And uh, I said, when is Peter Parker going to go to graduate school? Because he's an inventor. He's invented the web shooters, all this stuff. He said, he didn't know me. He says, let's talk, hang out afterwards. Let's have a conversation. We had a brief conversation. He invited me to lunch. Wow, this is great. We had lunch. It was magnificent. I brought him all the notes. Uh, that I had on what it would be like to be a graduate student and what Peter Parker would have to do. Would you be a teaching assistant, a research assistant, et cetera? He took them all and we had this amazing conversation. The breakthrough with Marvel Comics is that it's about superheroes with problems. Mm -hmm. And Spider-Man has problems, okay? <laughs> he said, who do you think is my favorite superhero? I said, I don't know. He said, the Silver Surfer because this guy has the most built-in problems of any character in comic books. The bad guys have lost him around. They're going to kill your uncle if you don't do this. You know, oh gosh. So he has all these hard decisions, um, et cetera. Uh, one, what um, Stanley did was uh, every Saturday for a while, there was a special Spider-Man feature, uh, ongoing comics and was in, the, in color and all that. In one feature, he had Peter Parker come to the university and talk to a professor, but being a student, and he made the professor look like me. Yes, a <laughs> moment of fame. Okay, that is a claim to fame that I don't yeah, think that's many it. people can. That's it. Not many people can have that brag. I don't think. Oh, not at all. But no. comics, I think, are it. I think this is the way. This might get some of the feeling of watching videos and the comic book literature is amazing in my opinion the stories are better all the time so uh, if we had time i'll tell you a couple of stories on this do we have time for one quick well, one? we do of course we do we've always got time for okay. your story uh, this is peter parker the spectacular spider-man uh came out in the 80s mm -hmm. peter, uh, spider-man is going from building to building and he hears the sound of an automobile accident he goes down to see what happened a young lady was driving and she has been, another car came crashing into her. He calls for an ambulance. She's badly injured. The medics come, they say, they take her to the hospital. Peter goes with them, damaged to both kidneys. She needs a transplant. Do you know any close relatives? He finds out she has a brother, not as close as you'd like, but not bad. And he goes looking for the brother, Donnie. Goes up to Donnie's apartment building. There's someone on the roof. What's going on? Could that be Donnie? He changes to Spider-Man, goes scampering up the side of the building. It is Donnie. He calls out and says, Donnie, don't jump, don't jump. Donnie looks back, notices that it's Spider-Man. He says, ah, oh, Spider-Man, I'm gonna jump and you can't stop me. I've got problems I can't face. Besides, you're a superhero, you don't have problems. Best lines ever in comic books. Spider-Man says, you think because I'm a superhero, I don't have problems? Mm -hmm. Donnie, life is problems. It's problems for all of us all the time. Mm -hmm. And we grow by facing our problems, not by running away. Besides, if you jump, 
you're killing your sister. Right. So Donnie comes down, they go to the, the operations of success. Peter is there for the surgery. When he's leaving the hospital at the end, he says, well, this one turned out okay, but Donnie's still depressed and there's not much I can do about that. You can't solve everyone's problems. This is a story about attempted suicide for kids and it works. Yeah, that is, it's impressive, isn't it? It's very impressive. It's impressive what you can do. And, and also the amount of words that you actually have in comic books as well, the amount you yeah. can pack in. Yeah, they've done analyses of comic book vocabulary. It's the whole range. Yeah. It's all the way through. You can get things, uh, you know, Bugs Bunny, Peter, uh, uh, Donald Duck, all the way up to sophisticated things. Like I, I just told you, uh, some of the dialogue with superheroes is 11th, 12th grade level. So it's all there. Wonderful stories. Everybody likes them. There is another question, and I'm wondering, because you seem very animated and motivated by comic books, I'm wondering if that is the answer to this question. How do you remain motivated to keep studying? Well, I'm like you. We have no choice. <laughs> this is our path. I didn't know it was my path until I went to that party, the youth hostel mm -hmm. party. But since then, Rumi talks about this. My life is on Oh no, it was Melville. My life is on a set of rails and it's, you can't go any other place. So it's never been a conscious decision for me. It's mm -hmm. something that I've known ever since that party that I must do in order to be happy. That's kind of strange, but we are all like that to some more or less extent. So I'm still interested because that's who I am. Mm -hmm. I've been fascinated by comics my whole life and fascinated by language acquisition without realizing ever since I allowed my, opened myself up to it. And I'm still interested. God, my God, I'm 81 years old. I know I look 78, but still, it's still, <laughs> it's still exciting. I yeah. still can't wait to look at the next book. Guy came over this morning, do some work on the house. I spoke Spanish to him. It was so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> it was great. It, yes. it's, it's that isn't it it's finding the joy in every situation i think you and i definitely have that same yeah. drive for this it's, there are some things i don't like okay i'm not good at and i don't like them which is yeah you know, i wish it weren't so but i'm not good at fixing things you know and home repair and stuff like that all this the things that bore me we're all different yeah well it looks like we've got more in common than i first thought <laughs> <laughs> Aha, gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that one of one of the main complaints I get at home is you remember all these languages, but you can never remember where the car keys are. <laughs> Me too, dude. Absolutely. Absolutely. I should also explain who I am. I call myself a junior polyglot, <laughs> which is perfect for me. Okay. Because the real issue is not just languages, but language acquisition and language teaching. Mm -hmm. I, I've had enough experience, and I'm getting more all the time, as a polyglot to make my work as an expert in language acquisition much, much better. It helps my research. It helps my theory. I have to know five, six, seven, whatever languages I know, but I'm not, I don't know, you know, 20 like you do, okay? Because that's not part of my path. Our paths overlap and you have interest in the theory as well, mm -hmm. but you're not writing articles for journals on theories and going through statistics. And that's what I like to do. And that is a really interesting thing because there are a couple of questions in the chat. And one of them is about how they can get hold of the things that you've written and read things that you've done. And I know this is a big thing for you that you have them on a website. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because you opened it all up very kindly. I would love to. Uh, first of all, the easy way is follow me on Twitter. S. Crashen. I want to catch up to Justin Bieber on the Twitter if I can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's an easy way. And then you get to read people like, uh, you know, Jeff McQuill and all my friends who do just great stuff and post it. The other is I've put it on the website, sdcrashen.com. A lot of articles, a lot of books, free download. You know what? You don't make money on that stuff anyway. <laughs> the books are too damn expensive anyway. Nobody buys them. They can't. 
I can't buy them. I can't afford it. So <laughs> nobody can. You know, like every two days, there'll be a new book for $60 American. I can't afford that. Nobody, unless you're, and the, the libraries have been absolutely useless. It's another thing I'm kind of, the academic libraries. Okay. So here's what I've done. I have found places that will download things for you for free. And not only do I do that, but I donate money to them because I think they do wonderful work. I send them $25 every so often, um, et cetera. It's probably illegal, but I don't care. It needs to be done. Otherwise, it's the end of science. Mm. There's a mathematician who started this. He said, if you you know, read an article and you want to get a copy, you pay $20. The journal gets the money, not the author. Mm. So free download and giving it away is the only practical thing to do. I have to find out ways of posting things a lot more easily so I can more easily send them out on Twitter. And my daughter's going to help me uh, all, with all the techie stuff. Fantastic. So yes, free access, open access. There are a few open access journals. That's where I publish. Okay. And the question that is linked to that in the chat is, do you have any specific recommendations? that you would advise people who want to read upon all this linguistic stuff? Where should they go and what should they start with? Any? Well, when you said recommendation, I was going to say, stay away from junk food, but I won't. Okay. <laughs> um, and drink lots of water, keep your blood pressure down. Uh, my books are free, if you can find them. And the colleagues I've had, <laughs> I got to mention Jeff again. He reminds me of this line in, in Star Wars, I was the master and you were the student. Now you are the master and I am this, that kind of stuff. And that's Jeff. He's done wonderful work. He's, he's, uh, he's known as Title Man for some reason. So I download everything by him. It's wonderful. Uh, I've mentioned Nishan Ashtari, who's done very good work. Uh, uh, Grace Cho, the people I cite are, of course, the ones you should read. But what work can I tell you? And this is all free. We're not making any money on it. If there were a way of making money, I would do it. I need to pay my bills. Of course. But we need to do ethical capitalism. So wow. it's for a good cause, okay? And it's the fair and honest profit. And what's going on, I think, in the textbook publishing industry, not only doesn't work according to the theory, but it's much too expensive. And yeah. they control the advertising. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm 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 with you. We we are basically one on this. I mean, this conference itself is donation based, so anything people can give, and we offer free tickets to people who can't, for whatever reason, pay anything. Because I'd rather people have the information, the knowledge, and the contact with each other than not. And like you, I'm never going to be a millionaire. <laughs> Well, I'm working on that. I, I'm, I've decided to do it on, on the basis of my lectures. <laughs> well, you might be. You might beat me to it, no, but I'm. I'm I'll tell I'm you what. No, I'm. I'm going to be as, as poor as a church mouse until until the day oh, I die. Keep, keep pushing your reputation and have you come and speak twenty languages all in a row like you do. That's so neat. Uh, anyway, as far as lectures are concerned, when the pandemic started, I volunteered to give free webinars, which was a good idea. I got lots of invitations. I gave like 70 of them in the first year. Wow. And that helped people understand the theory because I told lots of stories and mentioned the research. Uh, I realized I can't afford to do that anymore. So I do charge not much, okay? Mm -hmm. If you wanna know what it is, I'm now, I, my standard charge is $250, which is like, 1% of what some of my colleagues charge in the thousands, et cetera. Wow. And now people are complaining it's too much. We can't afford it. And that's the economy. Yeah. That's the Ukraine situation, which is just distorted economics all over the world. But that's the only way I know of, of making money, uh, et cetera. You and sound I, like an absolute bargain at that price to me. <laughs> you sound like a bargain at that price to me. I, I think it's okay. I think it's pretty good. I may have to lower it because people are saying my university will no longer pay anything. Oh, wow. Wow. Can you lower it price, you know, et cetera. That's because the, the international economy has gone crazy. 
yeah, it has. It's all gone very crazy. If um, I could charge more, I think I would do it. I learned this from my father who taught me ethical capitalism, the idea of getting the right price that's fair all around. My wife and I mm -hmm. went out to get our first car years ago and dad came with us. And I thought what you're supposed to do is bargain, get the price down. Mm -hmm. So the salesman came out and says, no, no, let's just, after a while, dad came up to me, put his arm around me, said, Stephen, come outside, I wanna to talk to you. <laughs> he said, <clears throat> you bargained enough. The price is good. He has given you good information about the car. And I can tell you, I know this field, he has named a very reasonable price. Don't cheat him out of his commission. He needs that to make a living. The price is fair. That influenced me enormously. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. The right price. We're not going to get rich on this, but I, I do want to keep eating and sleeping indoors if I can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you on that. I feel the same way. Yeah. I think I'd probably end up getting kicked out of the house before, <laughs> before that happened for the whole family. <laughs> Yeah, we've got to make a living. Uh, that's well, we true. Have. We have. Yeah. But seriously, thank you so, so much for your time. I really appreciate it. It's always such a pleasure to talk to you. And I hope we get to Likewise, do this. Likewise, Richard. Likewise. Um, I, I wish you could be with us in Cholula. Um, but while we've got Zoom, we can do Zoom again. And I'm always happy to talk to you. Great pleasure. I still absolutely admire you and I appreciate your generosity and openness on all these issues. It's been great. You've Love helped it. a lot of people this way. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Take care and I'll see you soon.